I want to help give you a different perspective on thoracic outlet syndrome that you may never have considered before. Now, if you're aware of it, I'm sure you know thoracic outlet syndrome is no joke, but I do think there are some things that are commonly overlooked as it relates to this and how these nerves can get compressed through this outlet and what we can do to open up and free some space so that way we can get better, faster results with this. It's very important to understand the anatomy of the thoracic outlet to understand what's going on here. It runs through what we call the scalene triangle and then in between the space of our first rib and back portion of our clavicle and then underneath our pec minor muscle and then it extends out through there. Now those three sections are essential to understand because they all have to do with breathing mechanics and respiration. Now many people with thoracic outlet syndrome tend to have very tight or restricted necks and also rib cages that are very stiff. Now under normal breathing mechanics, what happens is that we get a simultaneous expansion of the front and back side of the rib cage and also laterally. The rib cage expands in all directions and the ribs move into what we call external rotation. So they rotate up and they rotate away down here. Now, our diaphragm should help us create some expansion along with our intercostal muscles, but we also have these secondary muscles of inhalation, like I refer to in other content, which is our neck. And specifically the muscles that help us breathe when we can't expand our rib cage very well are our scalenes and SCM muscles. But we're gonna really focus on these scalenes in this video because the more and more tight our rib cage gets over time, the more it flattens out, so to speak. As that happens more and more, I hope what you can start to see is that this scapula is gonna start to get a little bit more elevated. And what happens with this collarbone right here is it also starts to get pushed up and together with the clavicle. So what you see is normally we have this angle right here between the scapula and the clavicle, but as you get more and more tightness and compression of the rib cage, that angle actually starts to narrow a little bit. And this compression starts to limit the space in between those, the scapula and the clavicle respectively. And that can limit how much area and space is in that thoracic outlet. But really what's happening at the root cause of that is that we're getting our neck to try to help us breathe because we lack the ability to get proper expansion in the first place. Now, when people have thoracic outlet syndrome, I am definitely going to be working alongside a physical therapist and or manual therapist who legally can do what we usually need, which is manual therapy on that individual to open up space. So that way that person can shut off their neck and they can effectively get the rib cage expansion we're looking for, which is step one. Now, there are a couple of manual techniques that I really like to begin to open up this space, but there is one in particular that I'm going to show you just for the example of learning and demonstration. And so uh, I want you to get comfortable understanding how we do this. And I also want you to get comfortable understanding that this is a hands-on licensed technique for a practitioner within the state that you practice in. For demonstration purposes, I have this young man, Jacob, laying on his back. I like the knees bent position, or you can have the feet elevated if it's more comfortable for the patient or for the individual that you're working with. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take both of my hands and I'm just going to get a lay of the land here. So we have clavicles right here. So I don't want to be on top of the collarbone because that's uncomfortable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come underneath the collarbone. And notice that the demographic that you're doing this with, if it's male or female, you need to be able to explain to them what you're doing because you're placing your hands in areas of the body that they need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I'm going to go ahead and um, place my hand underneath both clavicles to where it looks like this. Okay. And what I'm going to have him do is take a breath in his nose and as he goes to exhale, I'm going to guide one half of the rib cage down, the other half of the rib cage down, followed by the last repetition of the starting part where I'm, in this case, his right side. So now when he goes to take a breath of air in, take a breath of air in, I may allow him to move air into this chamber, this right apical chamber, while I still have my hand on this other side. Exhale for me. I'll take that down. 
As he's exhaling, he's continually exhaling. I'm going to do it in three cycles. Hold right there. Now, you may not be able to capture this on the audio or the, video or the visual, but he is taking a breath in, take a breath of air in nasally, and I let this left hand go to move air into this left apex. As he goes to exhale, that's a nice, long exhale. And so a common problem is people don't know how to exhale. So they may give me a very short exhale and not allow me to move that rib cage. Take a breath of air in, he's gonna put air over here. Those pauses that I've been giving him after exhalation was intentional because I don't want him to hyperventilate and get lightheaded on me. And now the other thing to consider is totally take another breath of air in and relax, good. So I gave, I gave a little stretch reflex. That's more of a proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation PNF technique, just, just for intercostal muscles. So one thing that I also want you to consider here is <clears throat> I timed my movement with the respiration. I ensured that the individual doing this learned how to properly exhale so that way you can take the rib cage down with, with, the, um, with the patient. And the other thing is the rib cage has to be able to rotate, internal and externally rotate. And you cannot do that with a CPR technique. This is not CPR. This is not from anterior to posterior you're going down. This is a movement that consists of a rib cage that is moving triplanar. It's not pump, pump, pump. It's triplanar movement in a rib cage. So if you, if you do it in a fashion where you're just pushing down, it's not going to be very effective because the patient won't like it. And when you go back and test, it won't test well. So the movement of the ex exhalation facilitated movement of a rib cage is down in, in a bit of a rotational pattern. So go ahead and take a breath in for me, my sir. Fully exhale. I'm below the clavicle, so I'm gonna take this right side, left side, and right side down, pause right there. So I'm just really taking up the slack as he exhales more, and it's in around three repetitions. Take a breath of air in. Notice there's gonna be some apical movement right here on camera. Go ahead and exhale again for me. I'm gonna take this side all the way down. We're gonna take this side down. He's fully exhaling, and now I'm gonna end right there. Pause for me and it's rotational, it's not one plane. Take a breath of air in, it's gonna put some air in right there. Fully exhale for me. I'm gonna take this left side down, I'm gonna take this right side down, I'm gonna take this left side down. Good, pause right there. And take another breath of air in, look at that right there. Fully exhale, and so you see I'm doing this in a rhythm, allowing that rib cage to move. This is very, very parasympathetic, and you may get a little pop at the rib cage sometimes at the sternum, that's okay too. Now take another breath of air in, and now that's a free breath right there, and fully exhale and relax. So now, how do I know where I'm, when I'm done? Well, I can do three or four breaths and then relax, have them take a normal respiration and go back and repeat that two or three more times. So now when we're looking at setup, how do I know how much towel to give this individual? So, well, one of the things that I would recommend is I'm going to take this towel because I want to show you it's really not that thick and I didn't even use all of the, all of the towel here. Um, it's totally your judgment based on your clinical awareness of the patient's size of their neck. If you see that this person has a nice little curve in there, why don't you just fill that up and use a towel to do so. If you fold it up and it's a beach towel and it's too much, the head's gonna be lifted up or the head's gonna be tilted back and it's gonna be inappropriate. This is a nice relaxed position of the face and the head and the neck and, and that's how I would kind of judge how much roll to put into that towel. What I'll do here is I'll take his right arm and notice how my hands place. I'm gonna come in and relax. I never really had to do any gripping here. That's pretty heavy. Maybe even uncomfortable because I'm really next to uh, nerves right here, like an ulnar nerve and a cubital tunnel. Don't, don't put a lot of pressure on that area. It's very uncomfortable for people. But if I have that hand resting on my waist and it's secured with a underhand support, he should feel comfortable where this arm drops. Does that feel okay? And then I can take the other hand and I can use my hypothene or eminence or the pinky side of my palm here and I can kind of look at that clavicle. I can come underneath that clavicle, see if there's any tenderness to palpation of that, 
of that subclavius muscle. And if there is an indication that there's some tenderness to palpation, if I check that first rib and kind of palpate there and I see that there's some limitation or elevation of that rib, that potentially could be helpful for this individual. Maybe there's a thoracic outlet component, maybe there's a number of things. Um, I don't have a diagnosis for this person because it's a demonstration, but as suggestions, you may want to consider that. So now that I have him positioned, we've already talked about grip and just kind of supporting the arm. I could easily rotate my body away and that's going to give him a little bit of distraction. Now if there's pathology going on in the shoulder, be mindful of that and don't irritate that. So now if I take my, my um, hypothenar eminence and I come underneath that clavicle, I can easily apply a little inferior, inferior um, traction or or pressure. And what I'll have you do is take a breath in your nose, place that air, direct that air underneath my hand, fully exhale, and I'm going to guide those top ribs down. Now, when he breathes in again, I'll do this again with my body. I'll rotate upon inhalation, so he's got a little bit of distraction here, fully exhale, and I'll take those ribs down. Sometimes you'll have a little bit of discomfort. Sometimes you may have a little bit of a pop. Um, and that may be expected. And so it's a good idea to inform the person that you're working with that this, these things may be expected and normal. Now, how do you know how much pressure to apply? Well, as you take a breath of air in, you're giving a very gentle rotation through your body, just enough to take this shoulder away, fully exhale, taking up the slack here, looking for visual cues, maybe some feedback from your patient, Take another breath of air in, fully exhale, four or five breaths, that should be sufficient to release whatever issues here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my hand. I have a clavicle right here. I'm going not on top of the clavicle, but below the clavicle, right there. And I'm pretty proximal to it. He'll go ahead and take a breath in for me nasally. As he takes a breath in, I'll just give a little bit of traction on that right arm, fully exhale. I'll take up the slack and guide those ribs down into internal rotation. Pause for a second. Let me get my body. I'm in a staggered stance. I'm using optimal body mechanics. Take another breath of air in, put that air into my hand. Fully exhale, and I'll take up that slack. Four or five breaths just like that. Sometimes you may have a little bit of pop, a little bit of release right here. That's to be expected. The amount of pressure I'm applying through this rib cage is probably a three or four out of ten. It's not much because I'm using his expiration and inhalation to help me. Inspiration and exhalation to guide and assist me while I'm guiding these ribs down. Upon inhalation, I'm also giving a little bit of pull, gentle pull, two or three out of 10 on this right shoulder. We also need to follow that up with stuff that's going to help shut off the front side of our neck and be able to get these scalenes to let go and these pec minors to release a little bit. Because remember, our shoulders are being elevated and usually also rolled forward. Pec minor and scalenes pick up a lot of leverage in that instance. So we need to be able to get our diaphragm to work and create expansion on our own after manual therapy usually and then get the neck to relax as the diaphragm works. One of my absolute favorite exercises for this is something like this. What we're going to do is get in a 90-90 supported position. Our feet don't necessarily need to be on a wall, just a chair works as long as you have around a 90 degree bend at both your knees and your hips. The purpose of this is just to make sure that your low back stays relaxed and you're not in an extended position. We just want the rib cage to be down nice and relaxed here. It is essential that we have a towel roll underneath our neck and the curvature of our neck is being supported by the thickness of that towel roll. So it will depend how thick that towel is going to be. But the general idea you're looking for is that it's giving you enough support to feel like your chin is pointing directly at the ceiling, but it's not so much to where it's tipping your head back further than that. And it's not so small to where your chin is dropping down. You should feel like you can totally relax and your chin is directly up. Now we have two yoga blocks right here because we're going to start the exercise by just getting our elbows directly out from our shoulders right about there and then just letting them fall back and resting completely passively on those objects. So they don't have to be yoga blocks. You can do whatever you want as long as you're getting an even height on both sides, something about four to six-ish inches. 
If you need something a little bit taller, so that way you can stay relaxed, you can do something like that, and that would be totally fine as well. So now the purpose of this is to make sure we can expand our rib cage without engaging our neck whatsoever. It's gonna be pretty hard for some people. So here's how I want you to breathe through this. Get a nice, soft, full exhale through your mouth with an open mouth, like you're making an O. Do that for about five to eight-ish seconds. And at the end of that exhale, you're going to feel your rib cage come down a little bit and you're going to feel a little bit, hopefully, of side ab engagement. Not your six-pack abs, but your side abs. And you're going to maintain a slight bit of tension in those side abs as you close your mouth and put your tongue to the roof of your mouth and inhale very silently through your nose. If you do that full exhale well, you'll see Trevor's ribs come down. Now he's going to close his mouth, put the tongue on the roof of the mouth, and silently inhale through his nose without engaging his neck whatsoever. So he's going to feel his chest rise a little bit, but again, never at the cost of him feeling his neck engage. Because the goal of this is to educate our body how to use our diaphragm and breathe without our neck, you need to make sure that your neck stays relaxed. So the biggest problem you're gonna have is feeling the front of your neck really wanna kick on. So if that's the case, then you can work with more shallow inhales and exhales. So if you feel like when you start to inhale, your neck's gonna kick on, stop the inhale before that point and then exhale again. If you need to move the strictly just nasal inhalations and exhalations, that's completely fine. Softer and longer breaths are always, always better than harder and more forceful here. Some common things you might feel which indicate that you're using your neck is obviously tension on the front side, but also the traps raising up like that. Now you are going to get some movement of the chest rising towards the ceiling and the rib cage as a whole, but it should be up, not necessarily shrugging vertically. Now, we also want to make sure that our low back stays flat on the ground. So when you inhale, you should not lose that back flatness on the ground. If you're doing that, you might need to drag your heels down into that object, that chair a little bit. Your hamstrings will kick on a little bit and that'll help you keep your back more flat. Now we also want to, again, create some space between the clavicle and also the scap right here. We want this space to be able to move from this compressed and elevated position and down and away. So that way we can get some space for that thoracic out outlet to not be so compressed. So one thing I'm a fan of are low reaching activities with a little bit of distraction to help pull the arm down, which will help open up space in here. Here's one really effective thing I like to use for that. All we're gonna do here is get a moderately strong band attached to something low, uh, whether that be a rack or some sort of post. And we want enough tension on there to where it's naturally pulling our arm away from us. And we need to make sure what's imperative here is that we have a low angle of a reach relative to our torso. So if our torso was perfectly upright, we would have a 60 or less degree angle of our humerus relative to that torso angle. Now, I like to get a grip like this on there. You don't wanna just hold the band regularly. If Trevor, you can show him that really quick. That won't give you quite as much of a pull and a distraction force as a grip like that will. Now, Trevor is going to get in a bilateral stance first, facing it perfectly straight on. He's gonna take a slight step back with the passive side. So that'd be the left side in this instance. He's going to make sure he stays heavy on the heels of both feet, but not losing the front of the foot on either side as well. And he's just going to allow the arm to be pulled away from him. And he's gonna keep his eyes perfectly straight ahead at the horizon. Trevor's gonna get a full exhale through his mouth here, trying to keep as little tension in his body as humanly possible. Just allowing that band to pull him forward. And he's gonna resist that again by staying back on his heels, but there should be really no tension in his body whatsoever. Sighing the air out is a great way to exhale here. And at the end of that exhale, he's gonna feel his side abs, particularly on the side that he's being pulled into, which is his left here and he's going to then close his mouth at the end of that exhale, put his tongue on the roof of his mouth and silently inhale through his nose. It should be a silent inhale, not one that kicks on his neck or is audible in any way. He's gonna do this for about five to 10 slow breath cycles. As he inhales, he should feel some expansion on that right side or the, or the side that he's being pulled away from. 
By far the biggest thing to look out for here is tension in your pec on the side that's reaching. If that's happening, you're probably trying to resist it in some way. Just let it happen. If it helps, put your passive hand on your pec to make sure that it's staying relaxed throughout this. Likewise, the other thing is to make sure you're not extending. That would also be resisting it, but through your low back. So make sure your rib cage is staying down, not slouching and depressing your sternum, but just keeping it in that position where it's down and not overly flaring because that would indicate you're moving through your low back. Hopefully that helps give you an idea of how you can really start to understand thoracic outlet syndrome better. Now, keep in mind that it's always important to work alongside a physical therapist when dealing with an issue like this because it can be so serious. But hopefully this helps shine some light on some of the underlying factors that are at play here.